Okay, let's get started. Uh, I'm Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier Chair here at CSIS. Uh, we're going to have a conversation about future directions for higher education in Africa. We have a very interesting panel that uh, my colleague Ramina Bandur, who's a senior fellow, will explain. We wanted to do this in the, in the context of several things. One is we uh, think uh, that we need to have a greater focus on Africa here at CSIS. We uh, need to be thinking about um, the fact that there's going to be as many as more than 2 billion people in Africa, and so the demographic uh, pull of gravity of Africa is going to be enormous. Uh, it's beyond what we're imagining now. Uh, we're going to have at least 400 million young people. Uh, and so higher education in Africa is not the, not the solution, but is part of a larger conversation about how we're going to uh, see Africa uh, transform itself, which it's going to transform itself in the, in the ways that, that, have, that uh, parts of Asia have done over the last 50 years. Um, what I say is this is not your grandparents' developing world, nor is it your grandparents' Africa. It's richer, freer, more capable, with a lot more agency and a lot more options. And when I tell American policymakers there are, are to the extent we don't hope, help, help meet the hopes and aspirations of African governments and people on the ground, they will take their business to the Chinese. So that, that's, the, that's, I think, the option we have to be thinking about. Um, there's huge, wonderful things happening on the ground that don't get well covered uh, in the press or elsewhere. Uh, and so we want to be thinking about what are the ways in which um, how we can think about participating in those solutions. We have a bipartisan task force on the future of work in developing countries that Ramina is leading. Um, and we're looking at, we have four country case studies, including Nigeria, India, Brazil, and Kazakhstan. And so Ramina was recently in Nigeria, uh, and I think also will inform some of the, the conversation that we're going to have. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor over to uh, our senior fellow, Ramina Bandura. Ramina. Thank you, Dan. And hello, everybody. Welcome to CSIS. I'm Ramina Bandura. I'm a senior fellow here, and I'm really um, pleased to be hosting this, this panel today. Um, Dan didn't mention, but in about an hour, we're going to solve all the higher education issues in <laughs> Africa. So um, I hope you're prepared. Um, so as Dan mentioned, you know, this is a, a huge continent with, you know, a lots of education needs, uh, and especially in higher education. We have a rising middle class. Um, I believe Ni Nigeria is going to be the third most populous country by 2050. Um, so, you know, there's, there's this unmet demand in, 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 in particular universities, um, in vocational and, and uh, vocational training, in uh, online platforms that can deliver learning. So uh, we have three great experts today. I'm going to quickly introduce them. Patrick Awa is the founder and president of Ashesi University um, College in, in Ghana. He founded Ashesi in 2002, and we're going to talk a little bit about how you came about doing that. Um, Otto uh, Chabikuli, he's director of Global Health Population and Nutrition in FHI 360. And uh, prior to that, you were a uh, university professor and uh, knows a lot about, um, you know, the, the Africa education system. And then finally, Alejandro Caballero, he's principal education specialist at IFC, but previously you were uh, education specialist in um, World Bank, right? Well, perfect. I'm going to kick off with a very general question to, to the three of you. Um, what are the main challenges that um, higher education in, in Africa is, is facing today? So this, like, I know it's a huge question, but I mean, what are, you, what are your takes? What are the main problems? Okay, I'll go. So it's such a big question, right? <laughs> Hence the hesitation. Um, I, I would say that um, it, one big problem uh, in higher ed is just uh, the focus of our mission. Um, and the, the fact that higher ed has been very focused on le rote learning, we were sort of, you know, running a pedagogy that was designed, you know, decades ago. Um, 
And this needs to change to be educating people who are critical thinkers, who are problem solvers, who are entrepreneuring in their mindset. Um, and, and we also need to take on very strongly this idea that we're educating, uh, or we should be educating ethical leaders for the future of the continent. Uh, so this is sort of, you know, a big issue that we need we need to solve. Uh, the second uh, problem is that, you know, in the 70s and 80s, uh, higher education in Africa suffered greatly from not enough uh, resources, and uh, our countries all suffered uh, significant brain drain in the higher ed system. Uh, so the faculty uh, uh, sort of was diminished. Uh, and we're, so we're in a sort of a rebuilding process at, at a time when demand for higher education is rising because of growing populations. And so the universities on the continent are overburdened with very high uh, you know, enrollments that don't match the resources. Um, and so very big class sizes um, and so on. And so, so there's this sort of transition that's happening, but uh, it's not happening quickly enough. And between these two problems, uh, you know, we now see uh, university graduates who are sort of exiting university and having great difficulty finding jobs and we also see, uh, you know, private sector uh, actors who are saying we can't find enough qualified people, <laughs> right? So there's this gap that needs to be that needs to be bridged. Um, and uh, you know, institutions like Ashesi um, are trying to show the way in how we we address both of these problems. Perfect. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, to um, add to that. I think when I look at the higher education, let's say in the next 15 to 20 years, the biggest challenge will be one of harmony. Harmony between the offerings of higher education, the industry, society, and um, the world, pretty much. Uh, because we're, we're, we're in a knowledge economy, and uh, that is where it's going to be even more uh, pronounced in the next 20, 25 years, competitiveness will depend on how much you can play in that particular environment. And for several years or decades, higher education has been developing, maybe not in harmony with what is needed at societal level. Uh, the evolution of society, the demand from the society, particularly now that we're going to have this youth bounce that will have access to information, that will have access and aspiration for a better life. Uh, higher education will be looked upon as one of the solutions to the needs of uh, the societal needs, but also there is also going to be some movement at the level of the industry, at the level of the economy, uh, moving from maybe extractive industry to a much more, maybe we'll, we might not even have manufacturing, we may just leap into, uh, depending on how technology will be absorbed on the continent it, um, in a different level. So higher education will have to adapt at those multiple levels to remain relevant. That's a big challenge for us. Alejandro? And I would maybe just add a, a couple of, of ideas. No? On access, I think that there, there's still an issue of, obviously, affordability in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Higher education is expensive. It is expensive for the, for the average income of, of much of the population. And if we still have gross enrollment rates that are single digit in, in many countries, I mean, expanding that is, is difficult in the absence of, of support systems also that help cope with the affordability issue. And obviously, we talk about demand side financing, student lending, and a number of things that I think would be beneficial also in the, in, in the sub-Saharan African context. Second point would be around quality. I think building national quality assurance systems is still, is still an objective for the region. I mean, some countries are doing an excellent job on that front. I think in Ghana, for instance, I mean, there's been significant progress and development. But we still believe that institutions need to go through the 
I mean, through the national systems to, to, to accredit themselves and, and, and to be able to, to be part of this continuous improvement process. We're very happy to, to hear that Ashesi, an institution that we've supported, you know, over, over the past few years through two different loans, has actually received the charter status in, 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 in Ghana. And obviously, I mean, they more than deserved it a long time ago, but, but it is a, a significant achievement. It's, it's some legitimacy, legitimacy also from the, from, the, from the national system that I think it's also important. And, and we would like to see many, many institutions go through the, these processes also going, going forward. I would maybe add something on the relevant side. I think labor informality is a reality in sub-Saharan Africa, and you need to prepare uh, graduates for employability. You know? And obviously, there's the whole issue of, of high youth unemployment in, in many countries, plus a structure which is quite informal and where the creation of wage paying jobs is, is, is a need for, for the system. No? And how to prepare students in that context, also taking into account the whole future of jobs agenda that Romina was alluding to, how to uh, prepare people for, 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 for a world that does not exist in a context where there's not sufficient jobs, of sufficient number of job of, of wage paying jobs is, 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 is a big issue. I would add maybe a final point on regulatory systems. We think regulations are important also for, for systems to develop. And in Sub-Saharan Africa, as it happens in other regions of the world, I wouldn't say it's just the case of, of Sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, regulations have not kept up with the development of the sectors. I mean, we see, I mean, realities in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and higher education, like for-profit provision. In some countries, we see the uh, rising uh, you know, online education, distance education models. All of this is really not addressed in detail in, in the regulations. There's more of a laissez-faire approach in many cases, and, and actually these things are not being forbidden in any way, but, but I think regulations probably need to, need to look also at a different reality and at a new higher education la landscape. Now, so I would mention th those four points uh, for, for now. Thank you. Um, now let's turn on to more specific questions on, on what you are what you are doing in each uh, of your institutions. Patrick, you founded um, Ashesi in 2002. That's been 16 years. Um, it's a private, nonprofit institution in Ghana. Tell me how um, you know this dream uh, of founding your own university come to uh, fruition, and what do you think um, Ashesi brings that is different in, in the Ghana context? Well, um, I was working at Microsoft um, at the time when I decided to uh, return to Ghana and help with development. And initially, I thought I would start a software company because that's, that was the industry I was in. Uh, but went to Ghana and realized that the way computer science was being taught and engineering was being taught was not very hands-on practical. And so um, the human capital um, question was, was a difficult one. Uh, I, I settled on, on education and higher education in particular because following uh, my decision that, okay, well, maybe not a software company, so I started to ask, what are the problems and look at different problems and ask for each of those problems why is this the way it is and if you ask why enough times we would always settle on leadership as a fundamental issue so leadership in terms of people in positions of influence who are accepting the status quo or were not solving problems or didn't expect problems to be solved and in some cases where there was just corruption mm -hmm. and so we, we ended up saying that, look, if we could educate the way future leaders, if we could change the way future leaders are educated, then we can change the country. And at the time I was asking these questions, only 5% of college age individuals in Ghana went to college. So that almost by definition, you know, what happened in our university classrooms was a predictor of what would happen when these 20 year olds were in their 40s and 50s, would be, they would be running the country. Um, and so this is how I got to the conclusion that I should get engaged with, with higher education and that I felt I would be able to pull together the resources and get the people uh, to join me that would 
that would enable us to do this. And just to follow up, what, um, what type of careers do, do you offer? What, what do you think is different um, in, in your university versus the, the rest? Well, the, the, big, the big difference uh, with, with the Shesi is we start with, uh, we, we start with this purpose that we're, we're educating people who should be the people who will transform a continent and, and that our university should be about educating ethical entrepreneurial leaders. And so as we've designed our curriculum, um, you know, we looked at you know, critical thinking is, is really fundamental, the ability to communicate in powerful ways, the ability to solve problems, to, en to tackle problems that are ambiguous, um, and a very deep ethical philosophy uh, for the future leadership of Africa is important. And so we developed, uh, and then we went to the private sector. Mm -hmm. um, actually, not just the private sector. We did focus groups with business leaders, military, um, faith-based organizations, and so on, and asked them, what should this new university do? And we took all of that together and ended up with a curriculum that blended the liberal arts with, with STEM and management. Mm -hmm. And so that is, that is what Ashesi has done, is we have this curriculum that gets students to study the humanities, the social sciences, design thinking, um, and leadership. Um, and then they're studying a lot of math and engineering and, and business. Just following up on uh, Alejandro, I wanted to um, ask you about, you know, the private sector participation in this area. Um, you know, IFC uh, is the private sector arm. Now you're leading the uh, health and education division. Do you see um, appetite for investments to go into higher education? How do you see the landscape changing in Africa in this regard? Um, what does IFC do in this in this area? Yes. No, I mean, Africa is part of the global trends in, in, in higher education, and that's clearly happening and, and has happened for, for some time. Uh, there's a lot of interest in, in, in African higher education. There's a number of entities trying to develop platforms, in some cases with a cross-border approach. Uh, we see some of some entities that are for profit uh, that are sponsored by private equity funds that are trying to play a consolidation role in the market. I mean, we've we've seen examples with emerging capital partners with 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 Marifa. I mean, there are some North African platforms like the one sponsored by Actis uh, with uh, Honoris United Universities that is starting to expand into Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, there are some South African groups, and we're very happy to support Advetech, one of the leading South African education companies that operates both schools and universities. Our theme for our collaboration with them was to expand into, in, into East, and, East and West Africa through an, an, a strategy that entailed mainly acquisitions and partnerships with higher education institutions in the region. Uh, we've uh, obviously, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, we're very happy to support Ashesi, which is a, an entity that, that has potential to bring lessons learned to the region, not only to Ghana, but to, to the broader region in terms of this liberal arts approach to education, promoting 21st century skills, critical thinking, and, and the whole link to entrepreneurship and employability. And that's a type of model that I think we would like to showcase and, and see more Ashesis happening in, in, different, in different parts of Africa. And also, I mean, IFC has, uh, I mean, we, we, we've been trying to promote, uh, and we see also interest by EdTech investors, education technology. Uh, we've supported Andela, which is a, 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 a bootcamp concept trying to, to leverage the skills arbitrage between uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and large, uh, 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 technology companies like Microsoft, Google, and the likes, placing uh, top African talent into some of these companies for 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 a for an extended uh, period of time, about four year training. So I think that's a model that we would like to leverage more. We're also establishing some. Uh, 
uh, some awards for ed tech companies that are innovative and that have potential to 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 bring uh, new approaches to, to 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 the to the African education landscape and and I think investors are starting to see uh, Sub-Saharan Africa as a very promising market as you know they're operating also in other parts of the world. Thank you, o Otto. Um, you, you are director of uh, health, population and nutrition in FHI 360. Uh, you also have a very a strong specialization on education. How is FHI 360 working in this space and how do you see the intersection between, you know, health interventions and education and learning, um, you know, uh, trending? So can you speak a little bit broadly on that? Thank you, Romina. Uh, what we, we're coming from the perspective that higher education, by the time a young person gets to higher education, what you're dealing with is a mind that you want to mold that you want to develop, that you want to make creative and entrepreneurial. And there's a question of readiness. So the children who are entering higher education today, they were born maybe 17, 18 years ago. Um, and a lot of things happened 17, 18 years ago that will determine whether their cognitive development has been optimally at attained. And that is where things like nutrition comes to the fore. There's a lot of um, evidence showing that the first 1,000 days from conception to the second uh, uh, birthday, that is where your development, cognitive development of a child is established. And if you miss that window, uh, you have impairment that will last for the rest of your life. So. Working with, uh, from a nutrition perspective, um, what, look, look, just look at the statistics as we, we st stand today in Africa, about 50 million children are stunted under age of five. That is about 40% of children under the age of five are stunted. Uh, and, and that is a condition that you cannot reverse anymore. By the time we're talking about the future, 10 years from now, they'll be entering college. And they've got already this disadvantage because they cannot optimally utilize the intellectual capacity. So, is FHR that fixable? Is that fixable? No, unfortunately. Um, FHR 360 working with USAID uh, under the LIFT project and uh, food and nutrition technical assistance, those are the kind of intervention we're bringing uh, to help the mothers and children who are going to be born today and prepare them for the future when they enter higher education by providing advice, by providing tools, by providing the necessary counseling so that uh, the children who are born and they grow on the continent of Africa, they are able to attain their full potential by the time they get to the higher education. So that will be one component of the work we do. Uh, we also have an intervention called Alive and Thrive that is funded by Gate Foundation along the same line, particularly very strong, fo strongly focused on breastfeeding as well. Uh, but the, uh, the other aspect of our work um, deals with young adolescent, particularly pregnancy among uh, the girls. 11% of pregnancies on the continent as we speak occur uh, um, among girls aged 15 to 19. And that is a big barrier for their progression. So uh, we, we work a lot, we, we, we do a lot of intervention in, in family planning and uh, making accessible uh, contraception so that we give opportunities to these uh, young adolescent girls to fulfill equal potential as the boys. But thirdly, FHR 360 also does a lot of research, a whole range of research in partnership with uh, universities in the US and in Africa uh, and it really ranged from operational research to implementation research to clinical trials. Um, and and um, we, we even do um, uh, a, a lot of uh, clinical trials with pharmaceutical companies. And that proximity with tertiary institutions uh, help us to, co uh, to increase the productivity, scientific productivity uh, of some of the tertiary institutions on the continent. 
Otto, you mentioned girls. Um, how, um, and this is a question to the three of you, how have uh, women's careers changed um, you know, throughout these 15 years in Africa with the choices, the uh, opportunities they get in higher education? Have you seen you know, a very positive change or what are the you know, still things that um, you know, we, we need to work on? Well, I mean, we when we look at statistics in in different in different countries, I mean, there's you know fairly even enrollment level in in at some levels of education, but we continue to see huge disparities in some disciplines. And I'm sure Patrick can talk a little bit about his engineering programs and actually and what's the reality there. But but the woman in science and engineering, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, it's an issue worldwide, and, and it continues to, to be an issue also in the sub-Saharan African context. And I, I think we've seen, I mean, progressively some institutions in our, in our appraisal processes when we have this discussion and we ask, you know, potential, uh, potential new IFC partners, what are they doing on this dimension? I mean, institutions are becoming much more aware that this is an area that they need to pay attention to. But it's still, I think, there, I mean, there's still significant, significant issues on that front. And again, we're trying just by mainstreaming some of these questions into, into our standard appraisal appraisal discussions, we, we can have a sense of, 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 of whether there's growing attention to these issues. I think, I think there is, but, uh, but I mean, there's obviously a lot to be done. Yeah, um, sure. So, so Alejandro is right that um, we see, um, you know, gender equity or balance in, uh, in certain disciplines, but not in others. In the sciences, um, if you look at medicine, uh, you'll see more uh, women, uh, you know, in medicine than, uh, say, computer science or, or engineering. And this is something that we are paying a lot of attention to at Ashesi. And um, our engineering program is now, I think, 40% women. Um, and it's something that, you know, we start four years ago, we started a program for high school students during our summer break that would bring them to campus and put them through a program in engineering and robotics and entrepreneurship. And we were very, uh, very clear that 50% of those kids had to be girls. And so, so we sort of built this pipeline of getting, you know, you know, boys and girls working together in engineering um, and, you know, the word goes back to the high schools when these kids go back to their high schools about how much fun it was and, and how capable they were of, of executing. Uh, so this is how we're, we're dealing with it. But, um, but Alejandro is right. I mean, if you, if you go to the law school or the medical school or, you know, in a, a business school, you're going to see more gender balance occurring than uh, in engineering. Um, as Dan mentioned, I, I was just back from Nigeria, and one uh, phrase that struck to me, and, and going back to Alejandro's point on employability, uh, an expert told me, you know, Nigeria has been producing decades of unemployable youth. So sometimes, you know, youth enter university, but they leave and they can't find jobs for, you know, maybe years. And at, at the same time, you have um, big vacancies in maybe, um, you know, maybe lesser uh, levels uh, of, of jobs, such as construction, et cetera. But, you know, youth also don't want to, uh, their, their aspirations are sort of against those uh, type of jobs in construction or agriculture. How do you see, um, you know, the role of the private sector in, in, in signaling of the types of skills that are needed and the types of professions that, young Africans, uh, you know, I'm not saying should aspire because, you know, you have your own strengths and your preferences, but, you know, if there's, the market is talking and uh, how do you see the, you know, companies, is there a role for companies in, in, you know, in universities and higher education? And then the second question is, um, what about 
technical and vocational training. Um, is that a thing in Africa? Do you see a, a growing market for, for, for that type of, of education? So anybody um, that wants to take a step. So, uh, so I'm glad you used the word signaling. Um, I think that the, the way private enterprise should engage is first of all be proactive about engaging the universities. Um, we go to the private sector and invite them onto a corporate advisory council to give us advice. Mm -hmm. We send students to internships and we're proactive about going and getting feedback from them. Not all universities go, go to the private sector, but I think it can be a two-way uh, street where the private sector can, can come to the universities and give feedback anyway. The second thing is I think a really important signaling um, mechanism is just uh, wages. So, you know, if the private sector is um, paying very low wages for vocational jobs, that signals to people who have aspirations to do better that they should be seeking other kinds of jobs. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think, and this is not just the private sector, even in the, in the public sector, in the civil service, um, in education and so on, that uh, we need to pay attention to how we're signaling to young people um, what promising careers are going to be. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, you say that you know. On the one hand, you've got the vocational, um, the vocational jobs that really need to be filled and are not being filled, but there's also some very some high-level management roles that are not being filled locally. They're being filled by expatriate staff, mm -hmm. and it is it is really important that industry is engaging universities to and technical universities to educate people for those roles, but they, there has to be that conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, before maybe I answer that, um, I wanted to add on the question of girls, that it's not only improving access at uh, undergraduate level, but there is also a question of modeling, role modeling, even among faculty, among senior staff, uh, the, there aren't enough uh, women in Africa who have attained the very high level of, uh, well, I mean, they, we should, we could get more, and, and that will encourage girls to even go even further. So on the question of employability, um, I agree that the dialogue between industry and higher education will have to happen, but also the government has a role to play. And there are some good examples. In South Africa, for example, and I think it starts by the government having a plan, understanding what are the, where the gaps are. And, and that could even inform things like uh, you know, immigration processes. Mm -hmm. What skills do we uh, allow in the country so that we protect the jobs that could be accrued to the local uh, population? And in South Africa, I think they've done quite a good, a, 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 a good uh, analysis of that. And they even went to the extent of giving tax breaks to companies that provide uh, internship to some of the graduates who are sitting out there and they still need some exp exposure because that becomes a, a critical barrier. You have a degree, you, you finish your education, but before getting a job, they say you need experience. And, and that is the first hurdle. How do you get experience before uh, getting employed? So South Africa has created an enabling environment for companies to take on some of the young ones to do uh, that internship, which will kickstart them into the job market. I think the region needs to strike a balance between supporting traditional industries and obviously agriculture, things that have to do with civil works. I think Romina, you were talking about that. Obviously, are, are I mean, will will be big generators of jobs in the future, but also I mean preparing the new generations for the world of the digital economy. And, and obviously this might sound in some cases ambitious, in some cases it's already a reality, but I think that there's a number of initiatives right now, and the World Bank is, is spearheading some of these 
trying to really leverage, I mean, the opportunity that digitalization brings in, in Africa in particular because of the potential to leapfrog traditional technologies and really, you know, get, uh, get, get ready for, for a new world where, where probably there will be new jobs being created in, 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 in areas that have to do with, with this whole dig digitalization agenda, be it maybe the traditional, you know, coding and, and jobs related to 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 to, to engineering and and so on, but also obviously there's a need for for bringing up the general skill level of the of the student population to perform other types of jobs that will have a digital component in in any case. No, I think IFC is starting to to see employability as a big area for the region, and we have here Asep Tadese, who's our head for, for the employability initiative within, within IFC. And, and the idea is really to work very closely with higher education institutions in developing a new agenda for employability, in trying to strengthen support structure for employability, thinking about employability not only in traditional ways, but also embracing entrepreneurship and, and the whole new future of work agenda that we're trying to promote. And we have a dedicated initiative on, on this front that is that is, is being launched these days with the, with the goal of supporting higher education institutions on, on, on this front through, through advisory services, basically. Thank you, uh, Alejandro. Um, talking about technology, how do you um, see technology impacting higher education? Are online platforms going to be you know, uh, important players in the future? Um, what challenges remain, you know, uh, probably rural access, uh, internet plans, from what I heard, are, are, can be very expensive. So are online platforms, um, online learning, you know, the MOOCs um, uh, going to be, you know, some uh, key players uh, in the future? Well, um, at Ashesi, uh, the way we've engaged with uh, online platforms has been more with a blended model. So there's some courses where students are getting uh, content online before they come to class. Um, there are um, instances where we use sort of digital platforms to really enhance uh, learning in a way that we weren't doing even, say, five years ago. So for example, a student studying statistics in, at Ashesi today um, has access to really large data sets um, and is working with real data mm -hmm. um, and formulating questions that they're trying to answer out of that data and cleaning it up and doing the analysis, etc. So, so the quality of the learning has changed because of access to technology. Um, we use online, we have an online learning management system so that uh, the way students engage with faculty, so there's an engagement that happens in the classroom, but there's also engagement that happens after class. You know, content is posted online, it's easy for students to have access to information, um, to have conversations with each other, both in the classroom and online. So that's how we're, we're uh, using this technology. I think there's, I mean, there's two angles to, to technology. You know? One angle is new, innovative uh, ed tech companies that are starting to see opportunities, and, and we start to see a lot of energy and, and action happening in, in, in the sub-Saharan African region. And I mean, again, Andela is an example of that, and some of the traditional MOOCs like Coursera have been you know, targeting the region and have a relatively large user base coming from the region already. You know? so, but those are more like ed tech dedicated models through either pure online or, or traditional or or, 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 or or traditional models leveraging technology very intensively. The other area where we th we see significant opportunity, and I think it, it, it goes to Patrick's point, is that uh, the digital transformation of tr of, of more traditional face-to-face -face providers. No, I mean the, the universities that are starting to adopt technology that are. Uh, using, I mean, introducing learning management systems that are offering in a traditional face-to-face -face, uh, course, maybe one hour, two hours per week of 
of online. I think that's also a big area and, and that's an area that we would like to, to, to support as well. And, and more and more, I mean, any university that we talk to, there's things happening already on, on this front. So, so I think either through pure models or, or, or through the digitalization of traditional providers that increasingly develop this type of tools, we, we see great potential for the region. And in particular, in the context of a very large access gap where we're still single digit in terms of gross enrollment rates. Uh, I mean, online has significant potential. I mean, there's uh, there's definitely issues, difficulties, uh, the whole internet connectivity in 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 cities outside uh, the main the main uh, metropolitan areas. I mean, that's a big. Uh, it's a big issue still. There's quality issues. I mean, let's not forget. I mean, there's a, a certain stigma about distance education that still prevails, and, and maybe for good reasons in some cases in, in some parts of the world. And I think uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is not, uh, is not different from that. I think there's, uh, as I mentioned earlier, regulatory barriers, because this has not been properly regulated. But there's I mean, I think that the private sector is, is moving faster, obviously, than regulations. I mean, there's models uh, targeting the region now, even from outside sub-Saharan Africa, like University of Liverpool in the UK or UNICAF in Cyprus that are developing an offering for, for sub-Saharan Africa through distance learning. Some of the South African players like Educor, Mancosa, private players that see a huge opportunity in expanding into the rest of Africa through online and blended models, and maybe a typical converge, converges towards more hybrid and blended rather than pure online, because I think the region probably needs, needs this, and students in the region benefit significantly from having some face-to-face -face component as well. So I mean, this natural evolution, I think, is, is much needed if you want to also improve quality and, and make sure that the offering in, 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 in distance education is, is not that different from a quality perspective from, from the offering in, in traditional face-to-face -face programs. Yeah, I think if history is anything to go by, when technology starts moving forward, it, it, it hardly ever goes back. So it's not really a question of um, whether you know, distance, uh, the, the technology will be applied or not. I think in my mind is a question of how fast. Mm -hmm. And the determinant will be uh, accessibility to internet, you know, bandwidth once we have uh, um, fiber optic and, and high speed access on, on the continent. Uh, that that will, will speed up uh, adoption of technology. But also there is uh, that component of credentials. So if one, um, if one, for, um, takes up a course um, by distance learning and doesn't have the credentials that will give you the job, that will be a hindrance. But if you do get the credentials um, equivalent to those who f uh, follow the face-to-face, -face, that will be a facilitating uh, element to adoption of technology. Us as implementers of um, uh, international development programs, we see it already happening. Um, Ten years ago, almost every uh, in-service training used to happen in hotel, expensive, travel, per diem, and so on. But increasingly, people are using WhatsApp groups. People are using you know, Zoom, Skype uh, to, uh, to deliver the very same uh, in-service training that we used to deliver 10 years ago at a much cheaper rate. So I think technology will be part and parcel of the DNA of higher education in the future on, on, in Africa. Okay, I have a final question, which is really, um, I'm gonna cheat, it's, there, it's two, two questions in one. Um, so what, for, for each one of you, what keeps you up at night about higher education in Africa, and what gives you hope? Yes, I'm wrong. <laughs> well, uh, the thing that keeps me up at night is that um, you know we have this uh, demographic bulge happening in Africa, and um, you know there's a there's a real urgency in making sure that our higher ed systems are are educating people who will create the sort of the economic environment um, and the social environment for that economic bulge to be a good one. 
Um, we obviously need uh, more access and we need more quality in, in higher ed. The thing that gives me hope is that um, we think about scale. Scale happens uh, from two things, really, uh, the government and the market. Um, and, you know, I look at Ghana today, uh, actually this is not just Ghana, but you look at Nigeria, Kenya, you see a lot of energy in higher ed around you know, government engagement and, and private sector engagement in terms of the numbers of seats coming online. Uh, so in Ghana today, there are now 80 private universities that are accredited. Um, and the public universities, um, you know, 30 years ago, there were really just three. Mm -hmm. Now there are uh, 10 public universities and eight technical universities. Um, and so th there, there is an expansion happening, mm -hmm. and it's good to see that expansion happening. Um, if we can do it with quality, um, we will catch up and we will meet the need. So that's what keeps me, gives me hope. What, what keeps me awake at night is just the impatience of the youth. We're going to have a lot of uh, young people, we are already having a lot of young people eager, hungry for knowledge and advancement. And they want education today, not yesterday. They won't wait. Um, and if they don't get it on the continent, they will walk through the, the, the Sahara Desert, they will swim if they have to swim across the Atlantic, and they'll, they'll get away, they'll, they'll go where they, f they feel the future is. Um, and that, th then the government and the private sector have to react very quickly. And traditionally, higher education has been ex extremely slow in reform. To change curriculum, I think in South Africa, it used to take us about three years of negotiation and, and talking and so on. I don't think the youth will have the patience for that. So we need a private higher education that is very nimble and uh, very quick to adapt to the demand that is coming our way. Um, and my hope is, um, is, is the future. Again, it is, it's the, the very same youth. Um, I think they'll get what they want because we have no choice. Then, but just to give them what they want, and when they become leaders, uh, they will be much more. But they will be much more savvy than the leaders that we have today. They will adopt technology much faster than some of our leadership on the continent, and and that is my hope. It's in the youth. Yeah. No, I think in in terms of of thoughts and and thinking about the sector. I think it's how do we incorporate lessons learned of international development experience and development of higher education sectors into the development of African higher education. I'm just thinking about the way some ed education systems evolved in, in Latin America, for instance, the case of Brazil, where today 75% of the sector is, is, is private, and, and this has helped uh, significantly expand capacity in, in, in a way that's, that's maybe very different from other markets. So I think, you know, making sure that given where the stage of development of African, Sub-Saharan African higher ed, we can incorporate some lessons learned from other, from other realities, from other markets, and make sure, I mean, we don't make same mistakes as in other countries, and, and, and we, we adopt ways of development that can be can be relevant, obviously, respecting the homegrown nature of, of the sector and the, the local particularities, which are very important. And I think in terms of, 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 of hope, I think, I mean, by being part of many discussions with many institutions in the region, I tend to see that many of the global trends that we see are, are happening already. And I think I mentioned this. I mean, the importance of new segments like working adults, you know, which is starting to be, to be relevant. I mean, the whole progressive grow of online education, even if starting from a low base, consolidation happening in some markets, new actors like private equity coming into, into the space. 
interest in cross-border activity, which is something that maybe we didn't see a few years ago. All of these things are already happening in, in sub-Saharan Africa, higher ed, and, and, and I think it, it, it gives me hope in terms of, of say, seeing that the development of the sector is, is, starting, is starting to happen. A lot of things need to be done, and there's still significant challenges and issue, but I'm hopeful that that we will continue to see this, this very strong development going forward. Well, thank you. Now we have about 15 to 20 minutes of public Q&A. Um, there is a mic at the back, and I'm going to take some, uh, a round of questions. And then um, the lady over there, you in the middle, and then um, the lady up here. Hi, good morning. Uh, thank you to all the panelists. Uh, Mr. Chabigul, please uh, introduce yourself. Oh, I'm Tiaji Salam Blythe. I work for Congressional Research Service. Um, Mr. Chabakuli actually kind of hit on the question I was going to ask Mr. Awa, and that's regarding um, accreditation, particularly international accreditation for your university. I looked it up online. I was quite impressed with what I saw. Um, and we have a lot of educated, highly educated cab drivers around here. It breaks my heart, African uh, cab drivers. So, and I would hate to see that happen for Shesi students. Uh, the ability to be able to take that education, go abroad and come back home is incredibly important, but it has to be internationally accredited and then they can't land in the United States or Europe and their education not be uh, respected. So I wanted to hear from you about how your university is dealing with that. Yeah, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rosemary Seguero. I'm a president of a um, company called Seguero's International Group. We focus on agriculture and the youth. I want to thank IFC. I've been talking to Filippi many, many times about this, especially when the Wifi money came. We talk about education and the women. So looking at all of you, you may be right or wrong. Education starts from grassroots. I have a school in my own country, Kenya. I come from Kenya, in the rural areas there. So when the students, those students, I teach them STEM, STEM and agriculture, chicken, what they know. So when we want to wait the schools, the small, the, the elementary, the, the, the kindergarten to come up there when they don't know anything, how do you expect to make them better than making them better from the beginning, the grassroots? So, Start making the children more than from kindergarten, acrobats, all these things we are talking about. And then when they are up there, then we are talking really sense. They know what they are doing, what they want. Because like now, looking, I focus on manufacturing. Apprenticeship, like the German mortals, the German mortals, many of them didn't go to university to become what they are. So how do we look growing the school's education from the grassroots to where you are looking at? Because you're just jumping like a baby from the stomach walking to the moon. No, we need to start from the ground, molding the young students in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and give them skills, leadership, corruption. And if you tell small children, they'll know, understand. But if you are telling a grown-up person who know corruption is bad, they know it's bad. But when you tell a small kid what we are talking here, for sure we will change Africa. So how can I work with you with my school from the ground <laughs> and put money? And Philippe, you know my story very well. Okay. I'll still go back to him. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll take the international basic education. All right. Um, so, I th I think that uh, the most important uh, accreditation, if you will, is just performance of of your output. Uh, and you know, we actually um, have a goal that most of our students most of our graduates should stay in Africa. So we, we, we work very hard to get them placed on the continent in really good jobs so that they don't feel a need to leave. But we also have a goal that they will be globally competitive and they will be helping run globally competitive companies. Um, and for that reason, we do care about whether our students, our graduates will get placed into graduate programs outside of Ghana, and whether they would qualify to get jobs outside of Ghana. Um, and 10% of them do. 
uh, we find that our, our graduates are not having problems getting placed in, in universities. Mostly they're going to the UK and the United States. Um, but they're going to, you know, canonical, well-known, very good schools like Oxford or University of Pennsylvania um, to do masters in computer science or business management and so on. And we f we see uh, companies, global companies like um, uh, Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Microsoft, Amazon. Uh, Amazon Web Services recruiting uh, from from a chassis, and that those graduates who go to those companies are actually performing at, at the level that their peers from around the world are doing, and I and so I think this is the most important thing. The early childhood education primary school issue. Um, I couldn't agree more, and I think that is uh, where FHR 360 we focus. We have programs uh, focusing on early childhood stimulation. We have programs uh, uh, that, that are targeting literacy um, and basic, basic, basic education on the continent. Um, and again, it is what, what you get after 15 years of life that is what you'll have to work with at higher education. If you get good material, you're going to get optimal output. If you don't have good material because you neglected the beginning, then you'll struggle. You'll still have results, but it's not going to be optimal results. Yeah, and I, I also obviously agree that, I mean, we, we need to work at all levels, and, and the World Bank Group is, is doing very, very big work in basic and secondary education, and also early childhood development in in the region. I would maybe mention something around technical vocational education and training. No, obviously, how important this is in, in, in many countries, and how, I mean, this might be a you know, an agenda for, for Africa going forward, developing not only obviously the tertiary level, technical and vocational, but the upper secondary as well. I think in this, uh, I mean, what I would like to see in a, in a few years is maybe institutions of relatively large size emerging in the region. I mean, I mean there's, it's a very fragmented space. We've tried to focus, as I have seen, supporting uh, technical vocational institutions, but uh, again, the size is still fairly small. There hasn't been the consolidation process that we start to see maybe in traditional universities. And uh, I mean, we're lacking. For instance, in, in Chile, we had, a, a, I mean, a, an institution that we were supporting with 100,000 students, no? I haven't really come across anything even closer to that in, in the region, but I think that's typically the type of scale that you need to also make sure that you have you know education of quality and and, and something that that can really have a system effect in at the country level so so I think that's an agenda I mean I think a lot of it a lot of support for the space needs to come from public sector as well but 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 private sector needs to be ready and I think at least from the private sector perspective, maybe the easiest way to, to, to expand into this segment is for universities that achieve certain scale. I'm thinking about maybe Mount Kenya University in Kenya or you know universities that are already at the 40,000, 50,000 student uh, size that they can start to go down market and venture into the technical vocational space. We've seen a lot of that happening in countries like Brazil where many of the institutions actually come from, from the university space and they go into technical vocational and operate a little bit at that intersection. But we haven't seen much of that yet happening in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Thank you. Um, I'll take some more questions. The gentleman in the back and the lady here. Thank you, Richard America, Georgetown University Business School. Hello, Patrick. I visited you some years ago. And you went to the Haas School at the University of California at Berkeley for your MBA, and I taught there many years ago, so we were go bears. <laughs> um, a two-part question. Governance at the Board of Trustees level, it's probably not where it needs to be at most universities in Africa. The Boards of Trustees need to get stronger. And if they perform at the highest level, a lot of other benefits follow 
throughout the institution. So what is happening to improve the performance of trustees who are very often cronies and rubber stamps and need to be replaced? And related to that is private individual philanthropy. That is Bill Gates, George Soros, Oprah, who could write a check for $100,000 for your business, I mean $100 million for your business school and make it world class almost overnight. Uh, that's how US business schools got where they are. An individual gave them a big chunk of money, made it possible for them to excel. So uh, what are you doing to tap those kind of people? Illumilu, Ban Cody, Ban Coley, Mo Ibrahim, billionaires in Africa funding business schools and engineering schools. Good morning. My name is Sabrina Robinson. I'm a summer advocacy intern at Malaria No More. Um, and I've spent considerable time in both Ghana and Nigeria, but I would say I'm more familiar with the Nigerian education system. And I think it's after your college um, experience, you have to do some sort of summer service. Um, and it's the topic of signaling earlier. Um, most students I know who are my counterparts aren't really um, interested in doing it that much, and it's also usually not along the track of what they'd like to do. So how do you see that sort of program kind of intermingling with what uh, Mr. Chibit Kuli said earlier about the government having to really play a part in, in helping students find their way? Thank you. Okay, so the question on the Board of Trustees and Governance and the role of African billionaires um, in philanthropy. Well, uh, well, we should start at home, no? <laughs> Charity begins at home, so. Well, um, I can tell you that um, our board of, uh, board of directors, so we have two boards. We have a board of trustees, the foundation here in the US, and a board of directors in Ghana. And both boards are, you know, working on fundraising. The, the US Board of Trustees is further along in sort of its uh, ability to raise money here. Um, but we're absolutely looking at two things for, for local fundraising. One is making sure that we're sort of cultivating our alumni, because that's a long-term future for fundraising, but also connecting with corporations and high net worth individuals. Um, and we're starting to see uh, interest in funding scholarships for students to come to, uh, to, come to a Shetty. So for example, uh, Jim Ovia, who is the founder of Zenith Bank in Nigeria, just did a big scholarship award uh, for students from all over the continent to come to a Shetty to study. Mm -hmm. So this is, you know, it's going to take us time to, to build it all out. Um, I wish um, uh, Soros and Gates and others were here to hear you ask them to give me a hundred million dollars. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, so, um, but you're, you're absolutely right. I think that, you know, wh when you, I look at um, international development in the U.S. role um, around the world, uh, one of the the strongest examples um, of really long-lasting impact is the India Institutes of Technology um, that were established with very strong U.S. support. Um, and this was, you know, a real intentional effort to build human capacity um, in India, hum human capital in, in India. And we, we need that in Africa as well. So I completely agree with you that um, you know the boards need to be stronger. Um, the, with the public universities, there's been sort of a history of depending on government funding, mm. um, and so they have government appointed boards and so on. Uh, th there needs to be a, a sort of a shift there to start to really look at how they raise funds from their alum, al alumni body. Um, I look at some of them and, and you know, they're you know, 60 years old and they have alumni who've, who, you know, who are quite influential in our country and I wish I had their alumni body, right? Um, so I think that there's real opportunity there um, to maximize capital inflows into higher ed. 
You know, I would just add a couple of thoughts on that. I mean, first of all, I think Acesi does a fa fantastic job on this front, obviously, in the context of the region and the broader context of uh, higher education in developing countries. I mean, I was extremely impressed when we, when we did our due diligence process, I mean, by the depth of some of the relationships that Acesi has with donors, obviously, many of them US-based, but increasingly aiming to, to be more global on that front. And I agree there's a lot of work to, to, to continue to be done on, on, on that front, but I think Ashes is starting from, from a very good base. I mean, I mean, and it's a unique model. I would tend to say we would like to see more of this happening. I think it's a great suggestion. And we would, we would love to see more donor engagement, in particular in capital development and capex intensive projects in higher education, because that's much needed. And as you rightly alluded, I mean, some of the big donations like Knight for Stanford and so on have really taken institutions to the next level. But that's, to be frank, very hard in developing countries. It's a, it's a very interesting agenda that we try to promote, and even through our employability tool, I mean, there's a significant analysis placed on alumni, alumni relations and how alums can contribute to an institution. But in, in general, we find it uh, as something hard to do in, in the developing country context. And, and it'd be great if we can spread the word and maybe get uh, get the word out to more you know high net worth individuals that investing in higher education is a very valuable investment and that many institutions in the developing world need this time this type of support to really kick off their processes and be able to to set up uh, uh, infrastructure of quality that is uh, equivalent to that in, in in countries like the US. The other question was on um, career services you meant or government There's support. Um, uh, program they have to do, and it's usually going out into more the rural areas. And okay. It's not aligned with what they would like to do, but it does have to do with some of that vocational discussion. So, address it and seeing how to make that more attractive and how to be on Yeah, I think. Yeah. Well, so Ghana has a similar system. We, we have a national service requirement for all Ghanaian citizens who go to university, whether it's a public or private university, to do national service for nine months. Um, and the national service placements can be going to work, you know, being placed by the National Service Secretariat to a government uh, agency or um, a school uh, somewhere in the country um, or they could go work in industry, but then the company pays the National Service Secretariat, right? And so students do both of these. They'll, they'll either get placed by the National Service Secretariat or go work in private sector. Um, I think of um, all of those engagements as useful. So for us, we, we have our students already working um, you know, in internships. We already have them uh, do community engagement projects in rural villages and urban uh, slums and so on. Um, and it's all part of getting them to really understand what the country looks like and getting them to see that they, they can make a difference to people. And so um, for them to go do that an additional nine months with the National Service Program it's just fine, and we see that our students go and do that, and they get back and get placed in uh, in whatever job they want. Um, so I, I I I don't see that there's a problem with it for students to do it. Um, the real the more important thing is if they go get placed in a government agency, where there isn't a lot of work to do. <laughs> And that's really unfortunate because you take a young person who's all sort of charged up after school and they go sit in a place and do nothing. But if they're getting placed teaching or, you know, that's, that's great. In, uh, in, in South Africa, it is slightly different. And that is the system I know the best. Um, we, we have a community service. Every graduate in, in critical professional uh, areas like nursing, uh, medical field, pharmacy, 
uh, you're compelled to do uh, one, sometimes two years of community services, but placed in an area of need. So you are not really taken out of your professional practice area, but you're just taken out of your comfort zone, out of your mother's home, and go and spend two years in a rural area with uh, much less um, amenities. And that is where a lot of young professionals, they complain a little bit. Uh, so we had in, in instances where a, a young graduate, like a nurse or a doctor, is put in a situation in a rural area where there aren't any senior doctors to mentor them. Uh, so you just dropped into the deep end and you have to, to swim pretty much. Um, and for some people, you know, they've taken advantage to build their confidence. Others were traumatized and say, never again, I won't, I won't do this again. Okay, unfortunately, uh, we ran out of time, but I wanna thank um, our panelists, so please join me in a round of applause and thank you for coming. <laughs>